Alright, so hopefully you've watched my prologue video and know what this is all about. So, I'm going to get right into it and we're going to review uh, Worlds Collide Parts 1, 2, and 3. Or as they're properly known, um, Mega Man Issue 24, Sonic Universe Issue 51, and Sonic the Hedgehog Issue 248. Um, now why am I looking at the covers? Well, if you look at the front cover, you'll notice that it tells you what part it is on the series, but it doesn't actually tell you what issue of the Mega Man comic you're reading. For that, you've got to go all the way down here to where the barcode is. And there you can see what issue it is. I can only guess that that was part of the way that, um, to help this feel like its own thing, they don't bog down the cover by putting issue numbers on it. Like, this isn't Mega Man issue 24. This is part one of the Worlds Collide special taking place in a Mega Man comic. Anyway, that's how I have chosen to interpret it. But, uh, if I, if I keep talking to the camera like this, this video is going to be way too long. There's three comics to go through here, so let's get started. The first issue's cover is simple, but hugely effective. It's Sonic and Mega Man standing back to back in front of uh, pictures and reaction shots of all the other characters. This is actually quite awesome, and was actually used as a promotional poster for the event months in advance. Actually holding this comic issue in my hand, knowing that there was a comic behind it and it wasn't just a poster, felt amazing that first day. The issue itself begins with this previously on page. Um, I'm not going to get into the the previously pages that are at the beginning of every issue, but I will show this first one, basically because it's explaining why this issue of Mega Man isn't following straight from the events of the previous one. But, you know, that's... you, you know that because this is a huge, colossal, uh, convention-throwing crossover event and not just another Mega Man issue. Okay, let's get started in the comic proper. Starting the comic, we see that the writers chose to go with the storytelling tool and Medius Res. That means instead of being told how the crossover is going to start, we are actually just plunged straight into the action, with Sonic and Mega Man fighting each other in Green Hill. Uh, we don't have any context yet, so we're left kind of confused. But it actually makes sense because if Sonic and Mega Man are fighting, they must be confused too. Now, I don't want to harp on this for the entire length of the issue, so I'm just going to mention it right here at the beginning, but the sequential art is actually amazing. I mean, if you can see, as um, each panel flows into the next, the characters' movements seem very fluid. And even though you're just looking at a bunch of static frames, it looks animated in some ways. Uh, this, this great artwork will be used throughout the entire uh, um, crossover event. And I just love the way that the art styles for Sonic and Mega Man uh, have been integrated so well. I mean, I've seen lots of cro crossovers where the characters from one comic are in a completely different style than the other, or, or, they, or one of them compromises their own style to match the other, but here, they both look very distinct as they're supposed to, and, and yet blend in just perfectly. I mean, this might have to do with the fact that both comics are done by the same artists, but still, it's admirable that they can make Sonic and Mega Man match each other so well. However, as Sonic and Mega Man continue their fight, they're observed from above by a mysterious robot who looks like he's a robot master done in the Mega Man art style, but with a distinct fox theme. Cut to the first appearance of the two evil scientists. Every second, Tailsman, and we're loving it. That's it, Hedgehog. Turn him to scrap. Go, Mega Man. Go. Exterminate the rodent. And we see Dr. Eggman and Dr. Wily drinking champagne and watching via video feed uh, Sonic and Mega Man pummel the crap out of each other while they count their Chaos Emerald collection. Tails, man? Sonic and Mega Man in the middle of a fight? Doctors drinking champagne? I think we've gone about as far as the Medias Res can go. I'm ready for some flashbacks and exposition. How about you guys? 
And we are provided with that on the very next page as we cut back to the regular Mega Man timeline. Don't talk back to me, Raw Moon. I said I wanted a met with a rice cooker function, so make it happen! Dr. Wily, I found something in the jungle while on patrol. Sweet mother of Edison! Look at the size of that sapphire! Ra Moon, the mysterious artificial intelligence that Dr. Wily had been working with for the past several issues, offers to examine the mysterious jewel because he senses power coming from it, but Wily opts to instead uh, make him make that rice cooking met and inspect the emerald himself. Uh, we know, of course, that this is actually the Chaos Emerald that has been missing from Sonic the Hedgehog since the Genesis arc. And as soon as he puts it into the scanner, there's a huge reaction. Cut to Dr. Eggman. Am I on? Yes, Dr. Eggman, you're on. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Okay, so Dr. Eggman is basically yelling at his empire for losing the Chaos Emerald and not being able to take out Sonic, you know, business as usual for the Eggman Empire, when all of a sudden his signal is overridden by Dr. Wily. There is a brief clash of egos, but the two scientists quickly realize that they've never heard of each other, and given their megalomaniacal tendencies, they really should have. Uh, that's when Dr. Eggman realizes that he's talking to another dimension. So a meeting is quickly set up, and they build themselves a little pocket dimension, which there's a cute little argument about, when there's when they come up with what they should call it. Skull Secret Zone! Egg Pocket Zone! Skull Secret! Egg Pocket! Skull Secret! Egg Pocket! Skull Egg! Skull Egg Zone! Well, we've had in Medias Res, we've had flashbacks, so it's time for another time-honored literary tradition. The Montage Sequence! Oh, wait, that's not literary, that's, uh, that's a TV trope. Montage time! And that's exactly what we're given. The next couple of pages is basically a montage of Dr. Eggman and Dr. Wily expositing the nature of their little skull egg zone. It turns out that time in the skull egg zone happens at a much accelerated pace. So what's only a few seconds in the outside world could be several hours in there. That gives them plenty of time to recreate their robot armies and build the big gigantic war machines which they can use to conquer both worlds. It is nice to see that Dr. Wily actually did get that rice cooking met. Ha ha. So finally they build their ultimate weapon. The... oh wait, quick game of rock paper scissors. The Wily Egg. A mashup of Death Egg 3 and the Wily Flying Fortress. Ooh ooh, I, I didn't want to break the flow but I wanted to talk about this panel a little bit. Um, Dr. Eggman says that he's built big battle stations in his day and he can make good primary designs, while Dr. Wily has a flair for internal defenses so he handles the details. This is actually a cute little reference for the game, noting that Sonic games uh, tend to have much flashier environments, while the Mega Man games are much more difficult because Wily's better at internal defenses. And it's good to see the games reference here too, you know. So with everything set up, Dr. Eggman re-employs the Genesis Wave, first seen in Sonic the Hedgehog issue 225. Now, if you would kindly press the Cosmic Reset button, Doctor, our realities will be reshaped and primed for our conquest. Don't mind if I do, Doctor. Oh yeah, there's also a quick exposition dump on this page, which explains to us, the readers, why they can't just use the Genesis Wave to erase Sonic and Mega Man from existence and take over a world where they never happened. It, the, basically, the Genesis Wave just doesn't work that way. So now we return to Sonic's universe right after the Genesis Wave launched, and we see Bass and Metal Sonic working together. Now, it's worth noting that in the Mega Man comic, Bass hasn't been built yet, but this isn't his first appearance either, because there was a time travel incident in Mega Man issue 20. But I digress. Hey, kid, the doctors need you for something. Remember... Punching small children in the face is the best way to prove that you're a badass. So Tails is captured and put in a glass tube, you know, as you do. And uh, Dr. Wily and Dr. Eggman explain to him that he's going to be part of an experiment. You see, it turns out that there's something weird with interdimensional travel. And people can't go from one universe to the other without escort from a native. That that's why Doc Metal Sonic had to accompany Bass. Uh, Bass wouldn't have been able to enter Sonic's universe by himself. So, 
the way that the doctors decide to get around this is by combining their technology, uh, Dr. Robotnik's Dr. Eggman's roboticizer with Dr. Wiley's robot master technology to create the roboticized masters, which would freely be able to enter both universes since they contain elements of each. Now back to the Mega Man universe. Um, as you can see, in the left part of the first panel, there's this little gradient effect. It was also in Tails' workshop. Uh, basically, this is how they show that the Genesis wave has just passed. And we see Proto Man standing on the roof of a building, and he hears a cry for help! Proto Man runs to investigate, and finds himself at the doors of a bank, where a familiar white glove is ripping open the safe door, and then flings it back at him, to be deflected by the trusty Proto Shield, of course. And with his iconic whistle, Proto Man enters the scene like a boss. You know, some heroes come in to heroic fanfare, others come in to the sound of a chorus of angels, but only the best come into the sound of a slide whistle. And so issue one ends with a proper reveal of four of the new roboticized masters. Tails Man, Knuckles Man, Rose Woman, and Shadow Man. Wait, isn't that last one kind of redundant? Well, a lot of stuff happened in issue one, didn't it? And seeing how it's just right after, and totally not several days after I recorded the first part of this video, let's move on to Worlds Collide number two. The cover for issue two is just as awesome. Did I mention that these are actually drawn by Spaz? my favorite artist for the Sonic the Hedgehog comic. I don't think I mentioned it for issue one, but yeah, all the covers for Worlds Collide were done by none other than Spaz. The theme of the cover is actually meant to look like the character select from a fighting game. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that the characters in the squares are even pixelated slightly, like you're looking at it on an old TV. Uh, it really makes me hope that Sonic comes back for the next Smash Brothers so I can actually have him fight Mega Man. That would be so awesome. The issue starts with the familiar gradient effect of the Genesis wave passing by and Dr. Light looking off into the distance as if he notices something that's wrong. I guess this, this would be like a sensation of deja vu. But then Mega Man enters and um, the thoughts are quickly thrown from his mind. Now there's just a brief moment to show the father-son relationship that Dr. Light and Mega Man share. Mega Man isn't merely his creation. He sees him as his own child. The same goes for Roll. Uh, speaking of which, she bursts in and says that there's something going on in the news. As it turns out, it's Proto Man doing battle with the roboticized masters that he just met at the end of the first issue. Now, I would question how the news is able to get the footage from these angles, but this is the Mega Man comic has established that flying camera robots are a thing, so. Yeah, they, I, could, I could see the security cameras inside the bank also having that same effect. Uh, realizing that Proto Man is going to need help, uh, Mega Man does his transformation from Rock to his superhero persona. And um, I'd like to point out something funny about the whole Mega Man transformation thing. Whether he's in his little civilian mode or superhero mode, the gigantic metal boots are always on. I mean, are huge gigantic armored boots that go all the way up to your knees just fashionable among children in the Mega Man universe? That's that's weird. It's kind of weird to think about. Now we join the battle itself. Proto Man is holding his own but he's outmatched and outnumbered. Fortunately Mega Man comes in and teleports him to safety. Blues! Proto Man! Are you damaged? No. I'm fine. Of course you are. You always are. I'm fine. Those robots down there. They're strong. Unusually strong. Eh, I've handled worse. What are they after? It's sort of a thing in the video games and this comic book that Proto Man really hates being repaired. Um, he, he refuses to admit to the full extent of his damage, mostly because of daddy issues actually. Uh, I decided to include this little exchange because it seems like such a natural line of dialogue between the two of them, despite the fact that this is actually the first time they've interacted in this new universe, 
It gets everything out right there at the beginning. Proto Man explains that the thing that they've stolen is that giant gemstone, and Mega Man is going to confront them. But Proto Man says that they're uh, stronger than the usual robot masters and seem somehow different and alien. That's okay. I fought alien robots too, remember? Wait, what? Um, admittedly, I haven't played every Mega Man game in existence. I've only played Mega Man's 1 through 10 from the main series. But, uh, when did it, Mega Man fight alien robots? I mean, I remember there being, like, that evil energy that came from space in Mega Man 8, but were any of the robots themselves that he fought there alien? Uh, citation needed, folks. This is... This is the one time when I kind of wish that there was a citation caption at the bottom of the, of the panel, like there almost always is every time they talk about something. <laughs> well, let's move on. I'm not even kidding. Uh, as you can see right here, as Mega Man joins the battle, we are once again given caption boxes explaining who the roboticized masters are, despite the fact that we've seen them right in the previous issue. This is a weird quirk of the Sonic the Hedgehog comics and now the Mega Man comics too, but every time a character is introduced, we get a name caption and sometimes a brief description as if it's the first time we're ever reading the comic, like they don't want to confuse new readers. I can appreciate that, but it can be a little bit jarring and distracting if you actually are a regular reader. And. Of course, Mega Man offers them a chance to surrender, and they proceed to go to kick his ass. Because, you know... Really, Mega Man? You expect them to surrender? <laughs> now we see the familiar gradient effect of the Genesis Wave as we join on the other half of this epic crossover. Huh. And there's that weird feeling, again? Can I have a deja vu about having deja vu? I mean, I come here a lot, but something feels off. Sonic is of course referring to the familiarity of Green Hill Zone contrasted with the fact that it's not really something that's part of the comic book universe. Um, this is of course treated as a quick segue to a montage showing how all of his friends that we've just seen as roboticized masters are missing. I especially love how he's going into Amy Rose's room showing his true desperation. I mean really. If he's actually willing to try and find Amy himself, you know he must be worried. That, of course, introduces us to our next trio of protagonists, the Chaotix. But I saw the truck! It was just a block away! For the last time, Charmy! You'll get some ice cream after the case is solved! Think of it like training! You can't reap the benefits until you do the work! That, and we couldn't afford an ice cream cone right now. Not my point! Forget you guys! I'm getting my ice cream, and they'll give it to me for free because I'm so cute and adorable. After that little establishing exchange, we get this weird boo zap sound effect, followed by the disappearance of Charmy the Bee. Vector and Espio split up to look for him, uh, and we're introduced to this Mega Man looking robot drawing a bead on Espio, right before we hear that same sound effect, and he disappears as well. Vector has one last chance to fight back, looking hilariously inept with an umbrella and trash can lid, before the robot also zaps him. Uh, it's finally revealed that this is the copy robot, Mega Man's evil doppelganger. And isn't that just totally doing the Star Wars Stormtrooper trope? I mean, like, like in, 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 these, story, in these kinds of stories, uh, if your guy is shooting something lethal, like bullets or lasers or arrows, they never hit unless it's like to barely graze them or put a hole in their shirt, you know? But if they're shooting something non-lethal, like a teleport beam or a stun ray, then they can't possibly miss. They will always get you with that non-lethal weapon. Like, why do they even equip themselves with with uh, regular firing. Are, are, are lethal weapons just that much harder to aim or something? <laughs> ah well. We return to Mega Man's part of the story as we again see some excellent sequential art in a battle sequence between him and the roboticized masters. Uh, we also get an, a plot point out when he 
when Mega Man manages to hit Knuckles Man with a with a fully charged shot, and he has a strange reaction to it. But before he can think of a way to exploit this new weakness, something blue and fast trips him up. That momentary distraction is all that this new blue thing and the roboticized masters need to escape into a warp ring. Uh, players of the video games may recognize the warp ring as the way you go into special stages. In the comic book, they can be used to teleport anywhere. Uh, Shadow Man is the last one through the portal, and Mega Man manages to hit him with a charge shot, stunning him in the same way and keeping the portal open just long enough that he can force his own way through it. The ring's destination is, of course, Green Hill. A uh, quick cut to Sonic as we see Silver come from the future, because he senses something is amok. Oh, hi, Silver! And then the copy robot hits him with the teleport beam. Bye, Silver! Sonic, having no idea what just happened to Silver, pursues the copy robot as it's revealed that the one that's been leading Mega Man and tripped him up back in his own world was Metal Sonic. So while Mega Man is trying to pursue the roboticized masters, Metal Sonic attacks him, goading him into chasing after him. So with the copy robot leading Sonic and Metal Sonic leading Mega Man, the two heroes are manipulated into fighting each other. Woo! Knock the scarf right off of ya! How do you like that? Thermal readings suggest that thing is organic, but that can't be right. Nothing alive is that fast. That hit must have damaged my sensors. And so, issue 2 ends where issue 1 began, with Sonic and Mega Man fighting each other, and Dr. Robotnik and Dr. Wily celebrating over glasses of champagne. Well, that was issue two. Wasn't that just action-packed? So now that we're, we've come full circle, let's get started on issue three. It's on! This issue's cover is pretty basic, but it's still awesome. It's just Sonic and Mega Man all up in each other's faces for a man-on-man -man fight. I uh, uh, don't really have anything to contribute to this. It just looks cool. The issue, of course, starts with Sonic and Mega Man in the middle of the fight, along with those traditional um, introducing the characters as if this is the first time you've ever seen the comic panels. Although if you look, Mega Man is introduced as the Super Fighting Robot. That's a nice little reference to the 90s Mega Man cartoon. You know, Super Fighting Robot, Mega Man. I promise that I will never sing again. And here we see a bit of a contrast between Sonic and Mega Man's fighting styles. Sonic likes to talk and taunt his opponent as he fights, you know, take, never taking anything too seriously. Although he does acknowledge that he recognizes Mega Man's sentience and even tries to cut a deal with him. Uh, Mega Man's fighting style is of course to stay quiet. He's much more cerebral and thinks about his opponent's abilities more. It's good, it, it, they're just showing how despite the fact that these two characters are similar in some respects, they're also very unique from each other. Of course, they're fighting in Green Hill, which is Sonic's turf, so he does have a clear advantage. And they even reference some of the video game's mechanics with those floating platforms. Of course, Tailsman is still doing his job of being a camera for the two evil scientists, as Dr. Eggman and Dr. Wily watch the feed. Uh, the way they banter with each other, it almost seems like they have a little betting pool of who's going to win. Also, as they uh, just endlessly compliment each other because, you know, the one thing that an ego likes to be, to be is fed by another massive ego, they have a nice little evil bro fist. I love how it actually has a little caption that says, evil bro fist. <laughs> That's right. No matter your IQ, gender, or alignment, there is no one on Earth who is above the fist bump. This bump. Also, the roboticized masters come back with the Chaos Emerald. Yay, yay, plot advancement. Let's get back to the fight. As the fight between Sonic and Mega Man continues, they come to the realization that neither one of them has really faced an opponent quite like this. In one of the rare moments of calm during this fight, they both come to the realization that there's a real chance that they might not be able to beat their opponent. Of course, that brief moment of introspection is interrupted by Sonic's massive ego. And he takes a second to evaluate exactly where he is, and again uses the home field advantage to take 
to take Mega Man on in the terrain that he just isn't really too experienced with. Utilizing his superior speed and those conveniently placed springboards that are in every Sonic level to completely confuse Mega Man. Of course, Mega Man's not out for the count yet, and uh, in a panel that could really be a pretty good speed stick deodorant ad, he manages to put up a bold face despite the fact that he's really concerned about his dropping energy supply. Now we return to Mega Man's world as Proto Man beams into Dr. Light's lab. You're all right. What they showed on the news looked... Mega Man pursued the strange attackers through some kind of portal. I took some readings. You might be able to help him. I see. Thank you, Blue... Er... Proto Man. Even in this universe, there's still some tension between Proto Man and Dr. Light, something that was just being established in the regular Mega Man comic. However, despite this, Roll is able to convince Proto Man to go to the repair bay. As we mentioned, Proto Man hates to admit to the extent of his damage and doesn't like being repaired, but he cares this much about Roll that he's willing to bite the bullet and let her fix him. Also, it's the first time we see Tango and Otto in the comic. Hey guys! Looking at the data, Dr. Light and Otto exposit a little bit about the Genesis Way's effect on Mega Man's world, in addition to mentioning another robot master, Time Man. Also, Look at Dr. Light's computer monitor. All the way in the left, that's a picture of a Mobius strip. I see what you did there. So anyway, Dr. Light's able to reverse engineer the warp ring technology and create one to, sit to get Mega Man back to his own world. This is actually quite in the nick of time, as Sonic finds a way to dismantle Mega Man's Mega Buster. <laughs> I can just imagine the dueling fandoms here. Okay. I'll accept that Dr. Light can reverse engineer warp ring technology and create his own in just a few minutes, but only if you grant that Sonic can identify a critical part of Dr. of Dr. Light's Mega Buster technology and dismantle Mega Man's weapon in the middle of a fight. <laughs> of course, we just accept both of these things because it's kind of badass. So Sonic and Mega Man go through the warp ring and Tails Man is ordered to pursue them. And this is the first time that Dr. Wily actually acknowledges Dr. Light in the entire series so far. Hmm. Well played, Thomas. Thomas? Who is Thomas? So Dr. Wily explains that there's another super scientist who could actually be a threat to the two of them, even though his ego won't let him admit that Dr. Light is exactly as good as he is. So, of course, Bass and Metal Sonic come in to volunteer their you know, expertise. And by expertise, I of course mean his kidnapping skills. Remember folks, if you ever need small children punched in the face, or to ruckus up some old dude, BASE is your man! On the other side of the warp ring, Sonic name drops a few locations from the video games and comic book where you would find human populations. But when he realizes that there's robots around him doing menial tasks, he realizes he has no idea where the heck he is. That's when Mega Man says that they're back on his home turf, and the field advantage is now his, as just to sweeten the deal, he calls in his support units. Rush, Beat, Tango, and, um, uh, I do not remember the little red guy. Wow. Um, just a second. Eddie, that's his name. Eddie, it's so human sounding, I just... Okay. <clears throat> and so, issue three ends with Mega Man proclaiming his sudden advantage, as we're all suddenly afraid of Sonic now. Well, afraid for Sonic now. Oh dear. So that's the first quarter of the Worlds Collide crossover. So what do I think of it? Well... The pacing's really good, actually. Um, the side characters all had something to do, and and but we still got plenty of action sequences. Also, despite the fact that Sonic and Mega Man are still in the dark and they're fighting each other, we actually a lot of stuff has actually happened. Um, Doctor Eggman and Doctor Wily have collected five of the Chaos Emeralds. Um, most of Sonic's friends have been captured and turned into roboticized masters. 
and we're starting to see the effect that the Genesis wave is having on both worlds as we're seeing people who have like a case of mass amnesia and like a sense of deja vu like uh, the Genesis wave has altered the world but on a subconscious level people realize that it's been altered so um, Future developments will be in later issues of the comic. Uh, hopefully it won't take me too long to make these review videos. Uh, if you want me to review them one issue at a time to maybe get them out a little bit faster. Although I think I kind of like this whole um, uh, three issue chunk because it actually presents the issues as you would receive them each month. You know, three issues per month. Um, so yeah, this has been my first real in-depth comic book review. And uh, let me know what you guys think about it in the comments below. Uh, also, stick around till after the credits. And now, a dramatic reading of the off-panel and short circuit strips by Wake Angel 2001. Hi there, it's a pleasure to meet you. Likewise, dude, you're a legend. Let's go kick some mad scientist butt. Ah ah ah, you have to follow crossover bylaws. We had to fight each other first? Really? Aw oh, man. Well, I'll try not to shoot you too hard. Don't sweat it, kid. I've handled my share of robots. Whew, we get a few issues of peace. Ergman and Wily failed concepts. Behold, I have applied the biomechanics of Sonic to my mightiest robot, making it unstoppable. I don't know, Al. He doesn't look any faster. I will end all of you. Ergman and Wily failed concepts. Part 2. Behold! I've replaced Metal Sonic's normal turbine torso with a Mega Buster! Hmm, I don't know. Start it up! Well, that's backfired!